their seats. Admit all. Right. Good evening, everyone. I say we are just about to get started. I've got a couple more people who are joining the meeting, it looks like. So we'll give them another minute or so, um, but then we will get tonight's presentation started. So thank you guys all so much for being here. I know I'm very excited and I hope everyone uh, is as well. Like I said, we'll give it just one more minute and then we'll be off to the races. All right, well, we will go ahead and we will get started. Um, it is, my name is Ray Slowick and I'm the education coordinator for the Lombard Historical Society. And I'm so grateful that everyone could join us um, this evening for our building a house history with uh, LHS archivist, Jean Crockett. Um, Jean has been working for the Historical Society for about 10 years um, and she is just an incredible wealth of knowledge um, about Lombard history and an excellent um, researcher as well. So with that, I am gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to her. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat and we'll take questions um, uh, during the presentation at uh, already predetermined point. So feel free to pop them in there and we will answer them later in the night. Good evening, everybody. How are y'all tonight? Um, glad you could make it here with us. And tonight we're going to be doing a program called Building a House History. And like Ray said, I'm the archivist at Lombard Historical Society. I've been there actually for 11 years now, Ray. <laughs> and um, our, we have about 5,000 Lombard properties with a variety of information on them in our archives. Uh, the original property files were started by Margot Free, our historian. And then um, as I've been there, we've been adding to them. We did have a local realtor um, donate some uh, seven boxes, actually, seven banker boxes of real estate listings. So I kind of know a lot about the houses in Lombard. And then I've also um, been on the committee for the uh, Lombard Historical and Architectural Survey, which was done in conjunction with the um, Historic Preservation Commission. So if you, ha if you haven't put haven't familiarized yourself with that or ever heard about it, it's actually on the um, village website under the Preservation Commission. And it's pretty cool. We've done three years so far of um, recognizing historic properties around Lombard. But tonight, what we're going to be doing is talking about building a house history. And I'm going to share my screen with you. So bear with me as I do this. John. Hoping everybody can see it once it comes up. <laughs> Technology is not my friend, Ray. Okay. Um, hopefully you can see the first slide. This is actually a photo, an aerial shot of Lombard. And um, basics is, Start with what you know. If you've ever done any kind of um, uh, family history, you've worked on your own genealogy, um, you know that you start with yourself. So with a house history, what you're gonna wanna do is start with what you know. When did you move there? Um, that sort of thing. And then um, just a little quote about historic preservation. Um, basically, 
building your house history is a way to connect yourself with the past. And it provides context. Who lived in your house and what did they do? Um, kind of interesting things to think about. So some of the questions you should start with asking yourself is, when did you buy the house? Who did you buy it from? And are there any neighbors that are longtime residents? And I, I like to go, I'm, I'm a digital girl, but I always say start analog with this because you'll want to have this in a way that it's not on your computer. You can look at it. You can write notes to yourself. And so start a notebook with these questions. Gather your tax records, your real estate information. When you go talk to your neighbors, just see what they know about the neighborhood. There might be a lot more changes. I remember talking to one woman who lives over on Grove Street, and she said when she moved in some 50 years ago, there was actually a horse that was kept in a barn at the end of her street on West Road. So that was 50 years ago. That's not that long ago. Um, you also want to know, need your pin for the property. And you'll see on the slide um, that it looks that what it, an example of a pin is. It also is known as the parcel number. Um, and that's on your tax records. If you're not sure of that, then the next step to go is to the township assessor. Most of Lombard falls into York Township. Um, you'll want to get something from them called the property record card. And you can go online to the township assessor's website and you'll get a variation of the property record card, but it's certainly not going to be as detailed as what you see in the image. Um, and every property has a different kind of property record card. Some of them have a wealth of information and others just maybe only have a picture and a few other things on them. Um, if you are in, on the west side of town, you might be living in Milton Township. And if you're on the north side of town, north of North Avenue, you might be in Addison Township. And that's also on your tax record. Um, what the assessor's office will do is um, it indicates um, a possible year for when the home was built. It may not be exact. Sometimes if a home was remodeled heavily, they may have that as the um, year that it was built and it might be off, but at least it's a start. Um, and I always tell you, call ahead, especially now um, with government offices having different hours because of the pandemic, you may want to just double check to, and they may not have anybody coming in, but they might be able to email records to you. Um, the other thing is the tax records and the DuPage County tax collector books are online. You'll need to know your block and lot numbers. There's no street names on that. And the tax books show information like property owners who paid the taxes. And when you're getting far enough back into these homes, you'll see a jump in taxes, which will indicate a change in the property. And that's one of the ways to determine how a house was, what year the house was built. Um, some other records to find, plat maps of your subdivision, uh, town maps showing streets, census records, city directories and phone books. And you'll see that I said permit records with limited availability. If you go to the village of Lombard, to get permit records, uh, they usually don't have, well, I should say usually, they pretty much do not have records prior to 1965. There was a flood at the Village Hall that um, destroyed a lot of the records. Uh, the other thing you're going to have to do is fill out what's called the Freedom of Information Act or FOIA paperwork, uh, and they have seven to 10 days, business days, to respond to that. Um, so that's, again, another one place you'll want to call ahead, find out what you need to do to get that paperwork. Um, at the Historical Society, we do have some maps. We do have some city directories and phone books. I'm only there two days a week. So if you send me a, re a research request, it does take a little bit of time. But in the meantime, um, the library also has records such as the census records. They do have genealogy databases. Uh, they also have access to the local newspapers on microfilm. So library is always a great resource to use. Um, does anybody have any questions at this time, Ray? Uh, yes, yeah, so we had one person who was um, said that they did a paper on the Leroy House um, in college and was interested in and had some of the home history in there with some slides and was interested in if we would want a copy of that. That would be great. Um, we're always happy to put information in the file. So 
Um, I will have my um, email on the resource list. We can uh, get that sent out to people. Um, otherwise, you can go to our website, LombardHistory.org, and you just look for the tab that says, I think, is it Education Ray? I can't remember how it goes. It is Learn. Learn. Okay. See, I was close, right? <laughs> um, click on the tab Learn, and then that will get informa um, the information for contact as well. So, But yes, any information that somebody has, if you have old photos of your home and you want to share them with us, um, we're always happy. We can, you know, we can scan them for you. We, we do have access to the scanner. Now, I will put a caveat on that. We are going to be closing the archives at some point, um, late summer, early fall. Um, we're going to be go undergoing construction. So it's going to be really hard to get information over this after the fall. It's going to be pretty hard to get information out of there because we're going to be packing everything up. But we'll do our best <laughs> to help you guys out. Awesome. I say, um, I know one person had a que another question about um, the information that's in the slides. We will have a full resource list um, uh, available at the end of tonight, and that is already on our website. So all of this information will be available because sometimes half the fun is doing the research yourself. Yeah. What I included on the research list was a listing of websites. Um, for the assessor's office, the, the DuPage County office, as well as the phone numbers to reach out to them. And then a, um, a listing of some of the books that we use for research purposes in the archives. Yes. Um, and as far as visiting the Historical Society to see any files on your own house, we do ask that you just make an appointment ahead of time. Um, and as Jean mentioned, we will be going under construction. Um, so, uh, please be patient with us as there will be a period of time where unfortunately we won't be able to have um, anyone in the archive because we won't even be allowed in the archive. Yeah. Um, but yes, we are happy to share. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable coming in, we um, are more than happy to find things digitally for you as well. Yeah, it just takes some time. So <laughs> be patient with us. Um, I also do want to add, Ray, that because the archives are fairly small, um, we have to look at like who's coming in that day and everything like that. Um, so we do, um, we're not, we haven't really had many appointments over the last year. We're kind of just still being pretty slow about getting back people back in to be able to research. So, um, when you do set up, if you do set up for information, the more information you can give me or any of the staff, cause actually all the staff gets to see, um, the research requests. Anything that you can get, give us, the more information we get from you, the better equipped we are to help you out. Awesome. I was saying that looks like um, that is the last of the questions. So if you want to move on to the next part of our, your presentation. Sure. So when I, when I was putting this together, I thought the best way to kind of explain everything, because it's, it's easy to tell people how to do things, but Sometimes it's better to have a case study. And so I did a case study of 18 East Prairie Street. And this actually is a view uh, from the 1874 Atlas of DuPage County. If you're familiar with that part of town, house doesn't quite look like this anymore. Obviously Prairie and uh, Main Street, what um, because Prairie is, uh, intersects with, with North Main Street. We obviously don't have carriages and things like that running around, but um, this really gave us a good clue that the house is a lot older than we thought it was. Um, and we had some information, it was pretty limited on what we have. Um, so one of the things we did look at was identifying the style of the house. And we were really lucky because this was one of the first homes that was on the 2014 um, architectural survey. And so we, when we worked with the architect, um, he did point out that this was called a one and a half story gable front cottage. And there's a book called um, A Field Guide to American Houses by Virginia McAllister. And it's really considered the Bible for doing house research and architectural history. Um, and this is a pretty common home in that era, era of time. Um, these homes were usually built with balloon framing, so it wasn't the heavy, you know, 
timber framing. If you've ever been to the pack home and you see those big beams with the, the bark still on them, those are really old homes. But these are the ones that were being built. We had railroads coming in, Chicago was really thriving. And so being able to process things like lumber was a lot easier and it was a lot easier to transport them. Um, Prairie is pretty close to the train tracks. So it was probably came in from one of the lumber mills on the train. Um, but yeah, so they, and you can see on the slide um, what the gable front looks like. On the field guide, um, they do show a two story house. Generally, they are one and a half stories. Now, over time, things changed on the house, so there's been some alterations. Um, and then we also know that the original legal name for the property is lots 11 and 12 in block four of the original town of Lombard. And we found that out on this 1874 map of Lombard. Um, that changed. So that will come up in, in another slide. But in 1870, using the tax collector books, we found out that a man named William Rogers played, paid $12.93 for lot 11 and 80 cents for lot 12. I don't know. I'd like to have those taxes nowadays because that would be kind of fun. Um, and you see a little dip in the taxes and then it went back up. And those dips in taxes do happen. And sometimes it's because of economy. There's, you know, there's a wide variety of factors. But nonetheless, it still tells you that that high of a tax on lot 11 means that there was a home there. There was something built on that. So an improvement made to the property. And then by 1873, lots 11 and 12 are combined. And then William Rogers is now paying over $16 in taxes. And then he buys lot 10, which is the lot that's to the um, west side of the property, right at Main Street. Um, so I wanted to know a little bit more about who William Rogers was. I mean, he was most likely the, the guy who the house was built for. And what did he do? Um, you've heard us probably say before at the Lombard Historical Society that we're a bedroom community and to Chicago and having the trains made it able for businessmen to travel by train to Chicago. So what was he? Well, in the 1870 federal census, it told us that he was a gasoline stove manufacturer in Chicago. He was born in Massachusetts. He had, was married, had two children, Hattie and William. And they also had a gardener, Benjamin Brown, who was living in that house. So kind of a small house for a lot of people, but you know, they made it work and it wasn't unusual. People did have, you know, someone boarding, somebody helping pay the bills. Um, having that little bit of rent always helped. Uh, William Rogers died in Chicago on April 15th in 1879. He's buried at Graceland Cemetery. When he was living in Lombard, he served as the town assessor. We were able to go through the village minutes from back in the 1870s, and we were able to find him there. That's how we knew he was part of, you know, the, the town council. He, he actually worked with the village. So it's kind of cool to find out. Um, and then in 1872, the minutes also had this notion that this notice that um, the village clerk was authorized to notify D. Haynes, who was one of his neighbors, and W. L. Rogers that they would, if they would build the sidewalk abutting their lots, the villa, the town would reimburse them to the amount of one half the usual expense or 12 and a half cents per foot. So they got to build their own sidewalks. And back then it wasn't like pouring concrete and doing things like that. Now it was building wood sidewalks to keep you know people off the mud. Um, but that was really pretty much the end of town at that time. And in, in the 1870s, you know, to the, to the north of them, going toward North Avenue now, which you see as a very dense suburban neighborhood, is, was actually a lot of farm. So kind of nice that they had uh, the ability to put sidewalks in up that way. And the view behind that, just so if you guys are curious, is actually looking um, at Main Street and St. Charles Road. Um, you'll see the train station is over on the back side of the photo uh, where the 7-Eleven is, there was um, a gas station. So a little bit past 1872 in that photo because you can see the cars and everything. It's kind of fun to see. Um, we also have a photo 
from, do you believe this one was from the 1890s? And this is actually 161 North Main Street, the James Claflin home. And you can see uh, 18 East Prairie off on the left side of the photo. So sometimes if you find old photos, you might have to look closely, but you might find a picture of your home or your neighborhood, which is kind of cool. Um, and then after William Rogers left, the next owner was a man named William Hayden and his wife, Harriet Winslow Hayden. And they had their daughter who was also named Harriet, which always makes it fun for genealogy. You always have to kind of, when you're doing genealogy, you always have to look at the birth years. And that's why I say notebooks are helpful. They will, if you write down the information, you may find the same name through several generations. And being able to note what birth year approximately that they have helps you keep people sorted out. Um, kind of a neat thing about William Hayden though was that he had a younger brother named Thomas Hayden. And Thomas Hayden married a woman named Flora Matson, who is the daughter of Newell Matson. And Newell Matson was the one who built uh, 23 West Maple, our Victorian cottage. And um, her sister actually lived where the DuPage Theater site was. That was the Andrews man Mansion, Bertha Matson. Matson Andrews lived there. Um, so they had some pretty big ties to Lombard. And an interesting thing is, is the tax records were show, showed that the property was owned by Mrs. Hayden and she paid the taxes. And that's not as unusual as you'd think. Sometimes men would put the property in their wife's name to protect it just in case they had any kind of lawsuits, um, any kind of legal dealings. This would kind of keep it out of the mix if they had to uh, surrender property. Um, the Haydens lived at 18 East Prairie from 1876 to 1882. And the other thing William Hayden did was he served as a Lombard trustee and he only did it for a very short time. He was voted in on April 3rd and by October 2nd, 1882, they had uh, removed him from his seat because he had left town. Um, nothing too scary. He actually had, he was into real estate development and he and his brother both moved out to Denver, Colorado and began developing um, big chunks of Denver at that time. Um, I, I kind of lost track of, of uh, William Hayden in the census records and everything after that, but I do know Thomas Hayden had a lot of connections. You'll still see Hayden subdivisions in the Denver area, which is kind of interesting to see. Um, sorry, going back here, jumped on the wrong slide. So, this is a picture of 18 East Prairie about 1920. And one of the things that we found out was there was an addition to the house um, about 1910, but you still see that original gable end. Um, so the house is beginning to look more like it does nowadays. Um, so adding on, they probably needed some more room in that house. So kind of interesting to find out. And then what do we know? Well, we know one thing. There was no 1890 census. That's a given for everybody across the country. The 1890 census was lost in a fire. So the only way that you can find any information in the 1890s is to look through tax records. Um, if you're doing a family history, you're gonna be looking for tax records. You're gonna be looking for voting records, um, trying to go through newspaper accounts to see if you can find any mention of them. So we knew that with the tax records, the Haydens sold the property by 1882 to a woman named Mrs. Gertrude Steele. But in 1883 to 1889, the taxes were paid by Harvey Thompson. So, okay, who was he? Why did Mrs. Steele own the property? And who was this Harvey Thompson? Well, the genealogy records showed that Harvey Thompson was the father of Gertrude Steele. And Gertrude was married to a man named William Knox Steele. And they went back and forth as paying the taxes during that time frame. And we found in the village minutes that um, William Steele served as trustee um, of the village from 1883 to 1885. So this house is kind of interesting because it's a lot of ties to Lombard history. Um, and then just some real quick records. Um, by 1891, the next owner of record was a man named Charles Holt and um, a man named H.R. Simons. 
And that's where we really start getting into some of the um, newspaper accounts. H.R. Uh, Simons, officially known as Henry Robert Simons, was the vice president of the First National Bank of Chicago. He died in 1892. His widow, Charlotte McKay Simons, became the next owner. And she married, again, a man named Cyrus Clark in 1894, becoming Charlotte McKay Simons Clark. And then Cyrus Clark died in 1904. But the Simons Clark family continued owning the property for a number of years. Um, Charlotte was the sister-in-law of James Ira Cochran, whose home is at 225 North Main. So it's not surprising she lived in Chicago. She had this property. It may have been an investment property. It may have been a summer home. There's, you know, it's very likely it could have been one or both. Um, but the Simons Clark family are very deeply tied with Chicago history and Chicago society. And I'll show you a little bit about that. Um, but this is giving you some more, another look at the house. So the photo on the um, left side is a picture of the home in the 1950s. And the picture on the right is in the 1990s. And really it's very minimal changes going on in that home. Um, the gable front has stayed with the house. Nobody's ever tried to raise the roof and add dormers or tried to make it bigger in any way, um, which is kind of interesting. It's, it's changed and hasn't changed. And so, is there any more questions? Anything else come in? Yes, we had one person, um, and I didn't know the answer to this. Um, how far back, if you know, does the village have um, records of like actual blueprints um, that may have been submitted? Is it going? We really don't have many blueprints. Um, they don't really, um, usually a blueprint will stay with the house. Mm -hmm. They When they go to the village, um, like if you're building a structure now or putting an addition on, they'll take the blueprint to review it. That'll go through the planning board, um, planning and zoning. Once they mark off on it, as far as I know, that goes back to the builder. Um, the owner might be lucky to get a copy. If you happen to buy a kit home, those definitely did not stay with the home. Those were actually supposed to be returned to Sears or Montgomery Wards, wherever the kit home came from. Um, they just didn't want copying. So if you do have a blueprint, they're pretty cool. They're, they're pretty rare, especially on these older homes. Um, mm -hmm. We do have a few blueprints in the archives, and it's mostly by homeowners that are selling the house and know that chances are it'll probably get tossed as extraneous paperwork by the next owners. So we've had a couple homes um, where um, they've donated the blueprints to us. We didn't even have a blueprint for the um, Victorian cottage until we had a volunteer who was an architect. And that was one of his tasks was he drew up all sorts of blueprints for us. So we knew where the plumbing runs were, where the, the electrical is. And it's, you know, it's a real treat to have those. Yes. So. Um, I say, and then someone just asked for a reminder of what year 18 East Prairie was built. 18 East Prairie was built about 1869, since we're seeing it in the 1870 census, I mean, the 1870 tax records. In the 1869 census, it wasn't showing up as being a home. So it was probably built between 1869 to 1870. Awesome. I say, and those are the current, the questions that we, uh, we had. Okay. Well, I can tell you some interesting facts about 18 East Prairie. Um, there was a newspaper article that I found and it was from the Chicago Chronicle that was published on June 20th, 1897. And it was titled, The Homes of the Society Deserted. It listed the families of the Chicago Society departing for summer homes. And towards the ending, a listing for the Cyrus Clarks will be at Lombard, Illinois. And I think about nowadays when we don't wanna tell anybody when we're going out of town. And this one goes on and on about where people lived and how their houses were gonna be empty for the summer. So it's definitely a different time. Um, Cyrus Clark was an interesting guy. He was actually a Chicago hotelier. And so he owned several hotels in, um, Actually, he owned a resort hotel in Fox Lake. He also owned one in Michigan. And toward the end of his life, he owned one in um, Mississippi. So 
it's kind of interesting when you're seeing some of these society people that they're being listed with that had, they were really kind of the elite Chicago group. And this is not a home you think of as being an elite Chicago society group home. It's, it's, um, it's a pretty modest cottage. So that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. And like I said earlier, Henry Simons uh, was the vice president of the First National Bank of Chicago. I did find a picture, an old um, line drawing of the First National Bank. Uh, Cyrus Clark being the hotel man, but he also has ties to the oldest home in Chicago, and that is the, the Clark home. It's, it's actually a museum in Chicago, and it's not on its original site. They did move it to its site um, Ray, do you remember where exactly it is? I, I should have written down my, my uh, notes where, where it's located. I don't off the top of my head, but I, let me do a quick Google search while you <laughs> Well, so the Clark home um, is, I want to say it goes back to the 1830s. Um, his parents were Henry Brown Clark and Carolyn Palmer Clark. Um, both of them passed away when Cyrus was a fairly young man. Um, but uh, when they moved the house on the site, they actually had to move it over the L tracks. And it happened to be done during a very cold period in Chicago and the lifts froze while they were lifting the house over the tracks. And it took three days before they could uh, get the house down. So people were going under the tracks, under the house. And being a museum person, that kind of scared me because I just think about all the things that could go wrong with that. <laughs> Yes, um, it looks like the Clark House is located on Indiana Avenue, um, just a little bit west of the lake between, um, just a little bit uh, south actually of the museum campus, um, between um, the museum campus and uh, McCormick Place. So, okay, so right. south end, south yeah, Blue so area, yeah. Right by the Stevenson and uh, where the Stevenson ends actually. Yeah, um, so it's kind of neat to know that they have something as old as our Sheldon Pack homestead. <laughs> um, another resident of the home that um, was placed here by family history, but we haven't found her name in the um, tax records, was a woman named Grace Thurston Claflin. Um, and her parents were Stephen Thurston and Annie Carpenter Thurston. Um, they had come to Lombard by 1880. She married William Claflin, whose parents lived right around the corner, that house that I showed you earlier. Um, her parents lived on the opposite end of the block. And then her son, Stephen, married a woman named Carlotta Olson, whose father was Dr. Olson, who lives at 150 North Main Street, or as we call it, the Santa Claus house. So it was kind of a tight-knit neighborhood. Um, and that picture that's in the corner is actually the, Claff the William Claflin family taking a Sunday drive out to Lake Ellen. Looks a little different nowadays, doesn't it? There used to be a spring out there. And that's what that big structure is, is the spring house that once stood where Lake Ellen is. Um, with um, one of the other interesting things is that particular neighborhood has a name that some people know in Lombard and some people don't, but that end of North Main Street around um, Prairie is known as Quality Hill. And there are a lot of really high quality Victorian homes there. Uh, if you haven't um, gotten the, uh, followed the link and watched our video or taken the tour of the um, Lombard homes, this uh, one of the homes is actually up in this neighborhood, um, 200 North Main Street. Um, we had hoped we were going to be able to put 18 East Prairie on there, but we ran out of time and we weren't able to quite get that one on. So, but yeah, so we have some really interesting homes in, in Lombard and we have a wide variety of ages of homes in Lombard. Um, this is probably a blast from the past. Not everybody's going to remember the book called Rascal which was published in the 60s. Ray, I know you're not gonna know that one. <laughs> um, but it was written by a man named Sterling North who grew up in um, Edgerton, Wisconsin. And it was the story of his boyhood and adopting an orphaned raccoon that he named Rascal. 
and it's a really it's a sweet book it's it's probably pretty dated for some people but it's an interesting slice of life growing up in the 1900s in Wisconsin and Sterling North actually rented 18 East Prairie and he only paid $35 a month for the home uh, he was working for the Chicago Daily News and his editor was Howard Mann who lived just down on Main Street um, Sterling North was a prolific writer and he was also a very talented writer you can see he um, you know, he, he really did a, had a very big career. He was, became an editor at a very young age. And then he became literary editor of the New York Post. Um, I actually had to break this one up because there were, um, we had an email with um, conversation with Sterling's children who are older now, but his son, David, had a funny story about when he, the family was living in what he called the little yellow house. And he said, there was a dinner party and several guests, but daddy was not there as he was off to be doing a radio show. He did some broadcasting and I think he wrote a soap opera for the radio too. At one point, everyone gathered around the old radio in the dining room or the hall nearby. It was up on four long legs and they listened to a broadcast of some kind in which daddy was involved. Meanwhile, thanks to some kind of high technology, 1930s high technology, Daddy was really in the house and had tampered with the radio in some manner, so that without appearing to do so, he broke into the program and said indiscreet things about one or more of the guests. And as they were sputtering, Daddy appeared out of nowhere to let everyone know it was a hoax. <laughs> that is one heck of a dinner party. And I think it's pretty funny that this man who was, you know, an older man at the time, that was one of his favorite stories about the house. He also said that the family loved to garden, and that was one of the things they really enjoyed was being able to garden at that house. Um, another notable resident, and this is actually a picture of her daughter. This is the picture is of a woman named Laura Standish, who was a lilac princess in the 1947 court in which Betty Bean was the queen. Um, her mother was Mariah Marilla Whittle Standish. Um, she died of pneumonia at age 29 in the home. Um, Marilla actually grew up in Oak Park. She went to Oak Park High School. She went on to Millican University. She married a man named Stuart Standish. Um, but what's really interesting is Marilla had this lineage of being related to the Churchills. She went all the way back to Deacon Winslow Churchill. So if you've heard that name before, he's one of the pioneers of DuPage County that came out from New York. Um, it's kind of neat that it's got some there's always been somebody there who's had some sort of tie to, to Lombard history, which is pretty cool. Um, and then remember what I was talking about just a little bit ago about the change to the legal name? There's a man named Carl Crookshank and his wife, Rachel. And they lived there from about 1940 through 1970. And their indelible mark on the property was that they re-subdivided the property. So you remember when William took the lots and he merged them. Well, now what they did was they split them apart. And so now the name is actually Crookshank's Resubdivision. So if you look at the um, tax records, you'll see that as part of their, the name of the property. And Carl Crookshank was the president of Lombard State Bank. He also worked with Illinois Bell Telephone. And another person that died in the house, he um, died in the backyard of the home in 1966. The uh, papers, did not pull any punches on that one. They said he had a heart attack while he was working in the garden. So um, his wife, Rachel, stayed in the home until 1970 when she sold it. Um, and just a little side note, one of the um, last owners in the last 10 years uh, was a young couple and they bought the house and they called and we did, you know, we worked together on doing some of the research and they were so happy to be in there and then they got a job transfer. So if anybody's listening from that house, that house has always been very loved. It seems like people have really loved that house for a very long time. It's kind of neat when you're driving down the street and you look at a house and you go, well, is that a 1940s house? Because when you're looking at 18 East Prairie from the street, you might think it looks kind of like a 1940s house. And it's actually an 1869 house. So much, much older than you'd think. And you might find the same thing about your own place. Hey, is there anything, any questions?
I say there haven't been any new um, questions come in, but if anyone does have any, please feel free to um, leave them in the chat. We had quite a few people um, sharing their love of the, the rascal book. Um, so I will have to add that to my own reading list because you are correct, Jean. Um, it is very, I have not read that book. Um, uh, they wanted to know what year Lombard was incorporated. Um, we were incorporated in 1869, so right around the same time that house was being built, Lombard got its name changed to Lombard. And wow. one of the one of the early residents of Lombard was Isaac Claflin, um, who heard his brother's name, James Claflin. Um, they were involved. They were Chicago real estate developers. So. They were probably running around Chicago, really talking up the town. Um, we did see a lot of development when the town was incorporated, um, town lots being formed. Uh, you know, you, you'll go through, if you look at, if even if you're just curious to look at the tax collector books, those are online and you start looking through some of the names and you're like, okay, Isaac Claflin owned like a hundred lots. What the heck is going on? And what he was doing was he was advertising in the Chicago papers about these great lots because it was so easy. I mean, it, you could get on the train, go into Chicago, and it would take you about an hour, pretty much about the same time that it takes you nowadays. Um, just we're as many stops, but the trains were a little slower. But it was really easy for a man to have his office in Chicago, do his work in Chicago, and have his family life out here where the air was a little cleaner and you had a little space, you had some room to have a garden or, you know, be able to have just a little bit quieter country life. So, um, and the other thing, when you're, if you're interested in trying to build your house history, it's really not as scary as you'd think. It's, it's once you start getting into it, it's more of a question of getting yourself to stop. <laughs> Um, we did have a question about um, finding um, the block and lot numbers for a person's home. Um, so those would should be on a plat record. Um, so it, when you do contact the township assessor's office, if it's not showing on your tax record, call the assessor's office to see if they can help you out um, and help you get that information. We do have um, the older map in of Lombard, the 1874 map that shows the lot and block number for um, the older part of town. Yeah. So. Awesome. I say, does anyone else um, have any other questions? Um, I did put in the chat um, the link to our, um, uh, uh, excuse me, our um, uh, email, our archive research. Um, so if you have um, are interested in uh, looking at some of the source messages um, or the resources for this, there's a link on there that will take you to that, as well as um, there is information there. Um, if you are looking to put in a research request, we do ask that you use the form. Um, it just gives us streamlined instead of trying to flood um, a single person's office and it just helps us with our processing on the back end. So we would really appreciate you using that. Um, and then we did have a que another question. Um, does the county's recorder office maintain title transfer history? I would think so, but again, that would probably be a good question to ask them. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they have started to add more and more information online, um, especially the older information. The having the tax collector books that are you know digitized and available as PDFs are amazing. So I, I would imagine they're really trying to be pretty transparent about records. So, but best thing to do is contact them. Um, I found that York Township has been just a real pleasure to work with. They're really nice people over there. They've answered kind of some strange questions for me when, you know, I've been trying, trying to help people do a research request. Um, you know, we, we were trying to figure out if a garage was, was attached and they were able to find a picture of the home in the 1960s showing that, no, the garage wasn't attached. So somebody had built a breezeway on the house at some point. Um, so, you know, <laughs> 
I don't, I don't think there are very many odd questions. Again, they're just, they're like us, you know, it's give them some time. If they can't answer the question right away, leave them your information, they'll get back to you. I say, if there is no other questions, um, I do want to thank everyone for coming tonight um, and uh, listening to our wonderful uh speaker. Um, we're so glad that you guys were all able to join us. Um, this will be available on our YouTube channel if you want to rewatch it. Um, and if you have not already um, visited our um, YouTube channel to see our history walk, uh, the historic home history walk that Jean mentioned earlier in the program, um, please definitely check that out. That has a ton of great information on some of the historic homes here in town. And uh, we really definitely recommend that you guys check that out. This is right up your alley. So once again, thank you guys all so much for coming. Um, please check out our website. Um, we will have a continuing uh, virtual program and we are bringing back some in-person programs for this summer as well. So keep an eye on our Facebook and on our website. Thank you all so much for coming and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Take care. Good night, everybody.